And my name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the uh, executive director of our Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve University. I also am a professor at Weatherhead, where I teach courses on entrepreneurship. And it is great to welcome everybody to our CWRU Entrepreneurship Alumni Speaker Series. And this is our first foray into the topic of dentistry. Um, I am the product, I've got dentistry in my own blood. So my, my grand, for anybody that's like old school, my grandfather passed away, Marvin Sugarman, was a periodontist uh, in Atlanta. And there's, I believe, I don't know if Margaret, the, the Sugarman tools. Yes. I don't think, are. I'm not sure if anybody still uses them, but um, that was my grandfather. So um, I, on my mom's side, I've got dentistry in the blood and um, my dad's side, my, um, my uncle Larry uh, mm -hmm. Frankel. Um, so you may notice the, the, the Frankel name and, and at least one of our panelists is, uh, is a uh, periodontist as well. So, and my own uh, dentist who I met during my day, during when I was a patient at the Case Dental Clinic, uh, Margaret Richard Frankel. So um, it's awesome to welcome uh, family, friends and, and others to this session today. And it's funny, Margaret and I, as her patient and watching in her practice, we talk about entrepreneurship and marketing and um, the business of dentistry for many, many years. And when we were talking about this panel today and what we've been doing at the Beal Institute, it was uh, really <clears throat> exciting to be able to welcome her. And, and she introduced me to Jeff Rosenthal and Jeff, it's great to connect with you today and, and hear about your own journey and building your practice and, and growing it and, and having two different perspectives um, in the world of, of dentistry and particularly in this moment of, of COVID-19 and where things are going. Um, we're thrilled to have Tanya Markarian um, as our um, moderator. Tanya holds degrees from two of our uh, schools at the university, and so she's got a foot um, in the world of dental medicine and also as a graduate of Weatherhead, so she's a perfect moderator. The way that we do these sessions is um, I'm going to pass it over to Tanya, and um, it's going to be very interactive, so we want to hear your questions. You can let Tanya know if you have a question uh, in the chat if you're here on Zoom. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, just put a note in the comments section and Elizabeth and I will be sort of toggling between this and Facebook Live and we're happy um, to, to get your question in and we'll be together for the next hour. So Tanya, with that, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, there was an article last month in the New York Times. The title of it is, How's the Economy Doing? Watch the Dentist. So apparently dentistry is a great barometer for the economy and how it's been impacted with COVID and what the recovery is going to be like. So we thought this is a perfect time to bring in um, our panel, Dr. Margaret Frankel and Dr. Jeff Rosenthal, and uh, talk a little bit about their careers, their practices, how they've evolved over time, and what their um, perspective is on this pandemic. So if you could please each introduce yourselves. Let's start first with Dr. Margaret Frankel. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement in your career and we'll follow up with Dr. Jeff Rosenthal. Awesome, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm excited to be sharing uh, what knowledge I have um, in the field of dentistry and in within entrepreneurship and dentistry. I graduated from Case Dental School in 2013 before that journey, I went to Bryn Mawr College, followed by Harvard University for my post-baccalaureate, and then I landed at Case. Um, after uh, dental school, I went directly into a private fee-for-service dental practice in Cleveland, Ohio, where we are today. Um, and I actually took over my father's pr dental practice. So right out of school, I jumped in um, and I, instead of doing a residency, um, had spoken with a lot of mentors within dentistry and um, decided that I was going to throw myself into private practice and into continuing education um, where I could pick and choose what interested me within the field of dentistry. Um, so I have been in private practice now. This is starting my uh, seventh year. August 12th will be the start of my seventh year. Um, and I have a family now, uh, two kids. I'm married. Uh, my husband, Dr. Jonathan Frankel, is a facial plastic surgeon at UH. Um, we've done actually some uh, 
cool combined uh, cases together, um, some trauma cases. And um, my focus now is on airway, um, airway dentistry and restorative preventative dentistry. Um, I do a lot of comprehensive care at my office. Thank you. Jeff, how about you? If you can tell us a little bit about your journey. Uh, so I, uh, let me see here. I was uh, born and raised in Pittsburgh and then my family moved to Indiana when I was in high school. I went to Indiana University in Bloomington and then uh, I went into dental school at Case Western. I did a year of residency in St. Louis doing a GPR there. Uh, my wife is born and raised in Cleveland, so we moved back here. And uh, I started in two part-time different practices. Uh, dentistry has evolved to where it is today, really throughout my entire career. I graduated Case in 96. Um, and when I started, there was just the typical single doctor private practice. There wasn't uh, big dentistry, there wasn't corporate. So I started in two part-time offices. Then I left one to partner and buy the older gentleman out. And that worked out well. I did that by myself for about 10 years. And towards the latter of my 10 years, dentistry really started to change. Uh, where people starting to do multiple practices. And uh, so I jumped on board. And so now I have nine offices around Cleveland. Uh, we have a dental lab that does a lot of our dental, you know, prosthetics, partials, dentures. We still do our crown and bridge with some local labs. Um, but the one lab that we have is in Akron and only services our offices. And uh, we're just, you know, just jumping on board, try to fight the corporate model to a certain degree, even though we're large. But, uh, you know, that's my journey. Okay, so Jeff, um, you and I graduated about a year apart from dental school yeah. and back in the 90s, we were not offered really any business management or entrepreneurship classes. So where did you develop those skills? Where did you gain that knowledge to be able to expand to nine practices today? Um, it, it sounds pretty simple, but a lot of it is true common sense. Uh, you know, when I first started in my very first office and the gentleman asked me to do the payables, things were being paid by alphabetical order. They weren't being paid by due dates. There were late charges, interest fees. It's a pretty simple concept to say, why are you paying a credit card company interest when you have the finances in your practice? It's just a system you have to set up. So I started to do a lot of reading of, you know, business journals, articles. I'm not a huge book reader, but I love articles. They're quick, they're right to the point. And then I get pretty skeptical and I start asking questions, why? Why does this office run at 40% overhead? Why does this office produce this much with four doctors and have a lower overhead? And you start asking questions and then you just learn. Uh, along with that, pay attention to everything that is around you. So it's not just dentistry, it's you know, we've evolved in our life of where we grew up and there was, you know, Sears Roebuck and that was the big, huge company. Well, now there's Target, there's Home Depot, there's Lowe's, there's, you know, major chains of supermarkets. Pay attention to what they're doing and just learn. That's pretty much how I've, I've really accomplished what I've done in, in my life. I have a very supportive wife and family. Um, I don't work an excessive amount, but I enjoy what I do tremendously. And I believe that I'm rewarded for it. And I can keep just adding a few more things, you know, every several months onto my plate. And it's just seemed to fall right into a nice system that I get used to. What would you say is the most challenging aspect of running multiple offices? <laughs> Staffing, 100%. I believe that's the hardest part of dentistry. I think the dentistry part of it is actually pretty easy. The more you do, what do they say, 10,000 reps and you become a perfectionist or a pro at something, the dentistry is easy. You build your confidence just by doing procedures one after another, but the staffing is always, always a challenge. Um, you know, especially in this environment we are right now, it's even more challenging than ever. The past four months have probably been the, the busiest four months of my career. Uh, yet we came out of our six week layoff here where dentists were shut down to emergency care and we grew by two acquisitions. So while everybody was really kind of 
sitting on the sideline worrying about what to do at their own practice, how to get the PPE. We were well ahead of the game. I anticipated this to happen. We were grabbing everything that we could with PPE gear that would fit our offices, shields and gowns and things. We started doing that back in February and it allowed us to grow by two acquisitions, one that started in July and another one we're getting ready to uh, go into and, and turn over probably sometime in early August. Okay. Um, this question, I guess, applies to both of you, but Margaret, I'd love it if you could answer it first. Um, did you develop or have a vision for what you wanted your practice to be at the outset or did it develop over time? Absolutely. So it for sure is is developing over time. Um, I knew I wanted to be in private practice. Um, I knew that my father's practice was very um, family focused. We treat our patients like they are family. So it's it's been a developing process in that we're growing a family. Um, that is one of our guiding principles. So um, it has evolved. Uh, since um, becoming involved in uh, SPEAR education and becoming visiting faculty out at that continuing education center, um, I've been provided a lot more knowledge on um, different ways practices can look and it's helped influence how I, I'm shaping mine. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's evolving. I actually hired a practice consultant uh, this year. I started in January with this with a consultant um, company through uh, Spear Practice Services, which was um, Pride Institute, which is pretty famous. Um, but they're helping me to tailor my vision and grow my vision of practice. Um, but it's family focused. Uh, dentistry, the practice of dentistry, I'm obsessed with. Um, I love uh, doing complicated cases. So I would say my practice is starting to look more like a prosthodontics practice actually, um, that focuses on like development of patient relationships. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, ever, it's, it's ever evolving, um, but it's kind of cool because it's, it's providing me more clarity as the process um, continues as to how I want my practice to look. Um, I don't envision a multi-practice entity. Um, I envision expansion, um, maybe, uh, you know, the ability to mentor and take on associates or partners, but I don't, I don't think I'm the, the practice that you'll see with multiple locations. Um, maybe a bigger footprint, um, but, but I don't think I'm the kind of practice where I want to, I want to go to scale with, you know, multiple offices. What about you, Jeff, as far as your vision? Oh, I have lots of options. That's sort of what I like about what I'm doing. We are not a, uh, a for anybody that doesn't know a, what's called a DSO, a dental service organization, which is typically a parent company and then has a uh, bunch of subsidiaries under it, different practices, maybe geographically all over the country or in a certain area, or even like Cleveland. Uh, all my offices are their own individual practices. They are not linked together. Uh, each is run as a community-based practice. And it's, it's a different model than the DSO. Um, it's not that I dislike the DSO, I just feel that it gives me more options to do so. You know, we can add another practice, we could sell one of them, we could merge with another group, we can act, acquire another group. I have a lot of options of what I wanna do. Uh, I don't really have any true vision. I'm kind of just feeling through as I've done my whole career. Uh, I've done everything without private equity money. I feel the, that the price to pay for private equity is quite steep uh, and it's not something that I wanna do. It has, uh, it's, it's caused me to slow down at some point where I cannot go and acquire a, a larger group of offices because of the limitations that a private bank would have on you. Uh, but that's put me in check a little bit and it's, it's a good business principle to have. They've become friends and advisors. I also work with a, a consultant like Margaret. And I work with a consultant uh, for my entire career. Um, he's a dental practice management guy that is local 
Um, and, you know, he started the same way I sort of did, small and then has grown larger. Um, but he has a multiple, you know, a lot of doctors around the area that he works with as well. Uh, he's sort of been my coach where I go into each office every week, every 10 days, and actually coach the team hands-on. I still do dentistry two days a week. Uh, I, I always look back and say I went to school to be a dentist. I didn't go to be a business person, so I don't really want to give it up. Um, but as far as a vision, uh, whatever the, the field holds, I don't have any limitations. It's, it's one of the nicer things that I've found about dentistry is you can be male, female, part-time, full-time, associate, owner, part owner. I mean, there are not a lot of fields that allow you to do all these options. Dentistry is very unique in that regard. And it's, it's really a fascinating field. And at least in the state of Ohio, we have a really, we have a gift. I mean, I, I, you know, you can't own a practice in Ohio unless you're a dentist. So it's, it's nice. I mean, somebody else has to have the a DDS or a DMD behind their name in order to be in our position. Uh, and that's one of the really nice things we've gone through our career, paid for a really wonderful education. And the gift back is, is that no one else can do it. So that's, uh, that's one of the things I really enjoy about it. I just want to add that I think in terms of where my vision, how, how it's guided is I actually think dentistry, the dentistry I love to do and the way I'm building relationships with patients has guided that transformation in my practice. Um, just thinking about it. So yeah, no doubt. Right. It kind of, it allows you to, you kind of start to follow that path where your passion is within the field. And right. that's what leads dentists on different paths. So I think following your passion within, within the field of dentistry can serve you very well. Um, it helps you get up in the morning and go to sleep every night feeling good about what you're doing. Um, and I, I think that that's really important. You have to listen to what you love about the, the field of dentistry and just follow that. And that's really important guiding principle for me. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the key components to dentists being successful is having an outstanding team around you who believe in your passion, who understand and appreciate your vision. Um, having said that, how did each one of you find good talent? How do you evaluate them? And even more importantly, um, how do you keep them? How do you keep them engaged? What motivates them to stay um, and to really be passionate about what you're doing and support you in your efforts of making a difference. I can take that first. Sure. Not, Jeff. Um, so I actually, as Jeff mentioned, I think um, this current environment, COVID, really has put a lens on, on the way staff um, are interacting with my practice, I'm sure Jeff too, it's, you know, there's a lot of talk within dentistry today about how safe it is during COVID. Um, and I think it, it's helped me really feel very fortunate um, to currently have the, the dental staff that I do have. And it's, it's been a work in progress and I think It'll be, it'll continue to be, it'll continue to change and be a work in progress over my entire career because that's what everyone says. But um, I, I feel very lucky. My staff really came together overall during COVID. Um, we have had, we had, even when we were closed and just accepting emergencies, we had weekly meetings. Uh, my office manager and I were in the, in the building, in the practice every day, using it as an opportunity to innovate and to um, basically develop protocols for our office to help it run more smoothly. Um, this time has been um, a gift and a curse, I think, uh, the time off that we had, um, but we helped to be extremely prepared in how we would um, manage patients upon returning to work. Um, I, I think the interview process is just the start of, um, of, you know, accepting staff as, um, into, into your practice, especially for mine, because we're a small practice and it really matters. We're together all day, every day. 
Um, so it starts with the interview, but then I have started to really do a lot of training outside of work hours with my staff. Uh, meetings, um, we travel to um, dental continuing education um, meetings as well together. Uh, I've taken my staff out to Arizona. Um, so it's, it's a process. We do team building activities we have for years, um, dinners, uh, yeah, weekly lunch meetings, check-ins every morning before we start uh, work and then we debrief at the end of every day. Um, I think those are like little moments, opportunities to help shape your staff. Um, the dentistry I'm doing, um, I think uh, provides buy-in for my staff too. They think they see that it's a little bit of a different practice from other places they've worked. Um, we, we reward them for their dedication to our practice in different ways. Um, so it's, it's, um, it can be tough um, managing staff, but I feel very lucky um, with where I am today uh, and who I have as a part of my team. I always say that um, it's not a hierarchy because it really doesn't feel like that in my office. It's really like a team, a team model um, where everyone should feel and have buy-in. Um, I couldn't do what I, what I do every day without my assistants um, or hygiene or my office manager. I call her the, the heart of my practice. I say I'm the soul and she's the heart of the practice. People know her by name. They expect um, that she'll answer the phone. They know she'll answer an email at, at any time of day, basically. Um, that's a big, that's a big win for me. And she's, she worked for my father and she stayed on and she has grown with my practice considerably. Um, we call it the RFD because my practice is Richard's Frankel Dentistry. We call it the choo-choo train and every success we have in practice in terms of growth and patient satisfaction, we choo-choo. So, you know, there's buy-in. We, um, We've developed a very unique office culture, I, I think. I'm sure many people would feel that way about a practice that they find to be successful for them. Um, my practice currently feels successful to me, and um, I think my staff feed off of that. Thank you. What about you, Jeff? Well, you know, Margaret's the leader of her practice. Every dentist that has their own office is the leader of their office. And you have to create your vision, your mission statement, create some sort of practice agreements that everybody adheres to. The interviewing process is, is um, it's tough to find out from somebody what they're really about in a 10, 20 minute interview. I mean, our days are busy. We have to respect everybody else's time to come in after hours to interview or in the morning or, hey, we have patients and we do it during the day. But, but the real the, the way to figure it out is really by asking your team what do they want and will they be a part of what your goals are and you sort of filter through it. I mean, we have upwards of about 140 different employees that you know work with us as a team. That includes dentists, which we're, I think, at about 25, 26 dentists now. Um, everybody has their own agenda. They have their own personal concerns. They have their own professional concerns. And you do the best you can in a short period of time to see if you can meet those goals that they have. And then you navigate through it. There's no easy way to do it. Um, you know, Margaret, I'm sure, has had turnover. We've had turnover. You know, maybe there's more, maybe there's less turnover now out of uh, coming out of coronavirus, uh, the period that we were shut down and where we are now. There's no doubt this is a very challenging, you know, staffing period. You know, there's lots of factors that are involved in that personal, professional, uh, you know, health concerns are, are unbelievable. Uh, and everybody has their, their opinions on it. So, you know, we discuss it. I mean, I think I've done more, you know, psychological coaching in the last four months than I've done, you know, hey, let's get going, you know, or hey, can we get this material or can we get that supply? That That's not the issue now. The issue now is how you doing? You okay? Your family good? You guys able to make it financially? Do you need a little help? You know, what we can do, what we can't do. That is um, what we've tried to do, even being as large as we are, create it down onto a small individual practice. You know, if I go into my Streetsboro Dental Office, which is where I clinically practice, we have a small team there. You know, we have 12, 13 people. 
You go into another one of my offices, we have another 12, 13 people there. They're, they know of each other. Patients don't switch over, uh, but the teams don't really, they don't ever switch over either. So each one is their own family and you have to find out what are their goals and see if you can meet them. And we do our best to navigate through it. That's fantastic. Um, I believe we have Dr. Brad Hyland joining us. Dr. Hyland, would you mind unmuting yourself and asking us your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. How are you? We're great. Thank great. you for joining us. How are you? Good, good. Question. What I'm curious, what is the percent of your overhead for your business staff and clinical staff? That's, uh, well, if you, if you look overall, we try to allocate in all of our offices, each one of them individually, about 20 to 22% uh of the revenues towards all three areas that would be uh front office and back office that includes uh the hygienists and the assistants with eftas that we have uh and the front office each department you know can go anywhere from seven to eight percent depending on where we're located and where uh, you know the volume of business that we do uh in really certain days i mean we don't we don't keep any Saturday or, or weekend hours in my offices. We have two evenings till seven in two different locations. Uh, but for the most part, we've gone to eight to four, eight to five hours because people's lives are valuable outside. It gives them a chance to go and do things. Uh, we've had that for years. We stopped Saturdays probably about three, almost four years ago. Um, so the, you know, some are busier, and so about 20 to 22% is typically what we allocate for all staff salaries, and we bonus them off that amount too. So all of my teams are bonused uh, based off of their salaries and wages in the same way, 20 to 22% bonus above a collected number that is really dependent on what their wages are. So it gets them to buy into the system, and when they say, oh, we're really busy, we need another person, you know, that affects their bonus. So they're, you know, they're, they're partners in the business uh, the same way you would have a true business partner that may own a percentage ownership, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, to answer your question, Brad, um, so I um, am currently upping my marketing um, and I'm starting with redeveloping my website and then we're gonna go focus more on social media marketing. Um, one of the things I'm working on in terms of bonusing my staff right now are um, for every Google review that comes in, that staff member who asked for that review is being bonused. Um, and then I have a high overhead and um, this is something that I'm working with my, my practice consultant. Um, again, small office, you know, looking for a lot of team buy-in um, and I work with master ceramists for the work that I'm doing. So my lab costs and material costs um, for a lot of my indirect cases is high. Um, so I'm looking to try and balance that a bit more, but um, my overhead, which is Im almost embarrassing to admit to um, a bunch of people interested in business is around 70%. So it's really high. Um, but it's working for my office and we're trying to tweak it a little bit. Um, and actually I, I own my building, so that doesn't even include um, a rent or anything like that. So I'm sure Jeff, you're like, oh my God, but um, it's high and we're working on it a little bit. Um, but it's, it's tough because it's, yeah. it's, I'm happy running the practice I'm way, the way I'm running my practice. Um, You'd be so. surprised, Margaret. We, um, we run all of our offices where we try to get the net profit to be about 18 to 25%. Okay. So, you know, when you talk about all overhead, you know, we're up there too, but that does include the doctor's salaries. I mean, with all the associates that are typically paid, what, what's going around the, uh, you know, Tanya, you could probably answer this, you know, being in the school. And I know there are some, some younger dentists, uh, uh, you know, viewing us as well. You know, I guess you get something anywhere from what, 28 to 32% net production, net collection, you know, labs sometimes included, sometimes not. You know, that's a, it's a, you know, you don't get that in, in retail. Yeah. Uh, you don't get that in the auto industry, um, you know, for percentage of that. 
uh, it's significant. Uh, but then our students that are coming out the dentist, their debt is, is really significant. Uh, and it takes them a lot of time uh, to get it, you know, under, you know, in their, you know, understanding what they need to do. You know, most of them have never had a job before that really is a full salaried or commission based business. So yes, I mean, everybody worries about their overhead, but you know, it, it's something that should be, in my opinion, should be focused on behind the scenes. If you bring it up overhead in front of your staff and you start talking about it with everybody there, yes, you could involve them into the business aspects, but they don't necessarily have the same interest that you do. And they don't necessarily have the same understanding or teaching or learning. So I've always tried to just say, hey, listen, we're gonna work with what we can do and we'll do the best we can to make sure that it works for you as well. And we love having you as a team member because they're very valuable. Listen, when you lose a team member, it, it, is, it is hard to replace. It costs you a lot of money to find somebody. You gotta advertise, you gotta take time to do it. Time is the one thing that, that none of us can get back. You can replace you know, hourly wages, you can replace materials, a handpiece. You can't replace your time that it takes to go find somebody, then coach them, then get them up to speed uh, and so, you know, the business aspects is something that I've taken on my shoulder and have had a few people, you know, within our group really focus on it with me, but it's not an everyday discussion. We, we talk about productivity collections and goals and, you know, yes, we do insurance and we have this reimbursement and that reimbursement, but you know, it, it's not, it can't be something that we really focus on our office. It's, it's very behind the scenes and, and I, um, I don't really try to make it the, anything that comes out to be public. I totally agree. It is not something that's uh, actively thought about. It's not always on my mind, and it's definitely not on my staff's mind. Um, if you break it down and you're looking um, for how to make your practice maybe more efficient or better to patients, you know, if you, you break up everything that goes into what overhead, what it costs to run a business, you don't focus on the big number, but you focus on every little aspect, you know, growing, satisfied patients, satisfied staff. It's a different story. You know, you don't, you're, I'm not guided, you know, by that number, so to speak. So. Right. There is only a hundred percent of what you do. Exactly. You know, it, it, it's, it sounds a little quirky to say that, but you know, if, if you have a dentist that makes, let's just say a hundred thousand dollar salary and you have a couple of employees that want a couple dollar hour raise. Great. You give it to them. If you don't increase your productivity, then it only comes from one place and that's the owner's pocket. Yep. And that's fine until the overhead becomes such a large number that then the owner doesn't feel like, you know, they're getting anything out of it. And then you have to decide, okay, am I going to go and, and do my practice this way and run it with, a certain level of overhead that I'm either happy with or not, or you have to start making changes. And oftentimes what Dennis will do is we'll avoid the confrontation with the employee. Oh, this, that person's so valuable and we couldn't lose them, but I can cut this material and go to this one and save money on that. There's only so much you can do because the sale reps that come into your office, they want to sell too, and they get a percentage of what they sell to you. And it's a, it's a tough trickle down effect. So you have to balance that very easily uh, or very, very, it's a very challenging environment and figure out what you can do uh, to make your business profitable uh, as well as pleasing your staff. I have a further question. If the, if the doctor was getting paid a hundred thousand for the year, I don't know if you'd share this, but how much would you expect that person to generate in collections? Uh, it, it, for me, it's nothing that I really worry about. I mean, we, one of the, the beauties of my offices is, is that, you know, we don't, we're, we're, our dentistry is designed for the masses of people. So if you have a hundred percent of people that, that would come into a dental office, I don't necessarily want the upper tier 5% and I don't want the bottom tier 5%. I want the large number of people to come in. I believe in insurance dentistry. I believe in creating value for people. Uh, I believe in Medicaid. I believe in Delta. I believe in fee for service. And uh, it's dentistry for me is really what opportunity can you give to the dentist to be able to improve their skills? 
And just by doing procedures over and over again, they will increase their speed and their confidence for sure. And therefore they get to do the increase in their income. Uh, that's, it's not something that I tend to worry about what they would be expected to produce. Uh, there is a difference when you do insurance dentistry, you're not paid as much per procedure, but as uh, I'm looking here at, at Shelly, you know, the leader of, of one of the most fabulous programs around having an expanded function dental assistant when used properly and trained to work with the dentist is a tremendous advantage to the doctor um, and to the practice and they should be compensated incredibly to do it because you know there's only two per there's only two producers in dentistry dentists and hygienists everybody else is support staff so the more you have in support staff that are better trained that are increased in compensation that are given more value ultimately you'll increase the the productivity of your office and then it's the owner's responsibility to make sure that it works financially for the business model but brad if you want to distill it to a numbers game it would just be percent of overhead, right? So right, yeah, but we're, right. Well, like, we're pretty busy at the office, and um, somehow our overhead's a little bit higher than we'd like. It's it's not bad, um, but I was just curious. So you can have you know you could have one doctor doing forty thousand a month. You could have another doctor doing eighty thousand a month. There's certain numbers that if they don't unfortunately meet those numbers, it's a business. And while they could be a nice guy and they could be really busy, um, we, we, I'm thinking of uh, actually one doctor we recently had, and he was averaging about $25,000 a month, and he was working his behind off, but somehow it, it didn't work with uh, $25,000 a month. And uh, you know, there's certain numbers that, that uh, it's a business that you have to be able to generate or you're not gonna, I don't see how you'd make your overhead. So I was just curious, what that cutoff number is when you have doctors employed. So I don't employ any other doctors. It's just me. Right. And I have a growth mindset. Um, I know that's sort of a loaded term, but um, I'm continuing to grow my practice. That's in terms of production, but really in terms of my honing my skill set within dentistry and marketing that. Um, and so I've been fortunate enough to grow in production, basically increasing my patient base. Um, becoming an expert in certain parts and practices of dentistry and being able to compensate myself appropriately for that, that's allowed for my production to, to go up, my production numbers to go up in the past. Well, now it's the start of my seventh year. So I've seen an insane amount of growth within my private practice. Every year I've pretty much doubled my production every year since I've started practice. It's been a it's been a um, exponential growth uh, period for me. I'm a little nervous to see what COVID brings in, um, you know, has in store for us. But so far, um, I have been able to um, to to secure, uh, you know, and I, I kind of measure how I practice in terms of complicated cases. But I've been able to secure at least five full mouth rehabilitation type practices since since COVID has started through virtual consults, um, people since they've come back in. But, you know, as the New York Times article alludes to, follow the dentist to, to gauge how the economy is doing. We are doing okay. I think that's a testament to, you know, productivity is a testament to, to how people are receiving your practice. Thank you so much for that. Um, I believe Hugh has a question for us. So if you, you could unmute yourself and jump in, please. Am I unmuted? Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, terrific. I, this I really is addressed to uh, Dr. Rosenthal, if you would. <clears throat> Having been a solo practitioner for 39 years, and prior to that in the 70s, being an associate in different groups, um, I found it very stressful um, with partners, with groups, a lot of office drama between staff, between doctors, between needs and wants, um, and chose for 39 years to, which I recently retired from, from a solo practice, the exact opposite model, 39 years of heaven on earth. It was just, you know, I, I honestly believe stress-free and look forward every Monday morning to coming in, um, which I don't believe I could have even 
uh, imagined in in a practice even with, with drama between two partners or three partners in dentistry, which I've witnessed over the years, good friends of mine. So I asked Dr. Rosenthal mm -hmm. about the stress levels of running an organization where there are just so many variables to, to consider and to, to, to do. And even when perhaps even some of your partners aren't on the same page as you, do you find the actual present, your presence in dentistry to be more of a business or is there a lot of enjoyment attached to it as well? Oh, I have a ton of enjoyment. I mean, and I mean that very seriously. Sure. Um, it's, uh, I don't personally find it stressful. One of the things that we do in every office is, you know, when we acquire it, we go right in and start saying to them, hey, what standards do you want to be held to? And most of the time we hear, I want to have fun and I don't want to do any subgrouping or gossiping because that can rip through a team very quickly. Those got to be the two, the two of the biggest things that everybody hears. So we put them down on paper and we say, okay, here are our practice agreements. And that ultimately is what we coach to. And I don't have to say to any individual, hey, you know, uh, you were talking about this person and saying this about that. I don't worry about the substance of the issue. I worry about, hey, listen, we have practice agreements and I'm asking you to hold to them. Can you do it? Yes or no. And if the answer is yes, great. And if the answer is no, it's my job to coach them up to that standard. And at some point, if we can't come to agreement, they know the writings on the wall that they should go looking for someplace else. I haven't fired too many people over the years. Most of the people that haven't jumped on board with our style of, of holding each other to that level have made the decision that, yeah, this just isn't for me. It's nothing that I want to be a, a part of. Uh, so, I mean, I, my biggest conundrum personally is, is that I like doing the dentistry, uh, but obviously the business part of it has taken a, uh, a great deal of time uh, and effort to do. And, you know, it, it has become, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a seven day a week job. Um, but I, I find myself balancing it very well. I don't have really any concerns. I don't sit there and say, God, I gotta get out of here for a day because it's driving me crazy. Nothing like that seems to bother me. I have a pretty level key uh, personality. I don't get too emotional about things. I just try to understand where somebody's coming from before I'll take action onto what they said. A lot of people fly off the handle for a lot of reasons, but you have to understand why it happened. And then you might be able to relate to them better and work through it. And I think a lot of the people that work with us appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. If I can just say one thing, I know, I know Dr. Hyland had a, had a question about, you know, the $25,000 versus somebody else that, that's higher. I'm not sure if he's still listening or not. My, my answer to that, having multiple doctors that work with me is to try to figure out what's going on with the doctor. You know, are we scheduling the doctor incorrectly? Is the doctor not capable of doing certain procedures? Are they not doing certain procedures? You know, Listen, I, I, do, I do endo, I do you know, extractions, I do bread and butter dentistry every single day, and that's what we do in my offices. We don't do the type of dentistry that, that Dr. Frankel does. I, I'm not qualified to do that, I'm not capable. And if I had a case like that, it's going right to her. My doctors are, are your general dentists that you read about every day. Hey, that guy's a dentist, that woman's a dentist, that person's a dentist bread and butter stuff that we do every day. Some of them can do procedures better than others and faster. So we will analyze what is going on with the doctor. Um, a lot of the younger doctors have a very big confidence issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they come That's out of school to three patients a day and then you put them into private practice and they're like, hey, where's uh, that person that I was gonna talk about this case? So it's confidence building. It's maybe they don't have the right assistant motivating them. Maybe I'm not motivating the right way. I won't necessarily look at the productivity for a long time in a sense of why are they unproductive or how are they productive? I'll look at it and say, hey, what are you doing on a daily basis? Where can we help you improve and what are your goals to do it? It requires a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one coaching. That is where most of my time is spent. Thank you for that. Um, Jacob Kim is also joining us, um, and I believe he has a question. Jacob, please go ahead. Hello, Dr. Markarian. Hello, Dr. Rosenthal. Hi, Jacob. How are you doing? 
I'm doing great. Jacob and I work together in Akron, and then he recently got married, and he's up in Canada now. So oh, cool. we yeah. always had this when there was basketball. Yes. And was Toronto and Cleveland, we dominated them. But, yeah. you know, lately we haven't done so well here in Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Dr. Rosenthal, I have a question for you. So I'm currently working as an associate, and, uh, you know, in the future I would like to buy a practice. What are some important things that I should look for when I'm looking for a practice to buy? Hey, Jacob, will you repeat the question for a second? Okay, I will. Yeah, so I'm currently working as an associate here in Canada. Okay. Now, one day I would like to buy, purchase an office. What are some important factors that I should look for when I'm trying to buy a practice? Uh, number one is getting over your fear of becoming, transitioning from an associate to an owner. You mm -hmm. can do it. Mm -hmm. Kate gave you the, the, the knowledge to do it. Mm -hmm. They give all of us that knowledge. Some of us run mm -hmm. with it and some of us don't. Mm -hmm. uh, so there will always be a fear. I mean, mm -hmm. I have fear every single day that I go in to look at another location. Uh, the next thing you want to know is, hey, listen, is the style of the practice what you're going to try to do? You can't take a fee-for-service practice and turn it into a total insurance-driven practice overnight. It's going to take a long time and you're going to have to transition it. Uh, next thing, you know, I, I, the, personally, I wouldn't go near an office that is not digital. Uh, digital is almost a standard of care now in offices. The offices that have not converted from, you know, what film x-rays or sending electronic claims need a significant amount of, of money to change it over. Um, and third is, you know, do you, can you relate to the style of patient that is there? You know, if you're going into a, uh, a very low income area, are you comfortable doing that? If you're going into a high income area, are you comfortable doing that? Uh, and then you want to start looking at the business aspects. You know, what are the percentages you, you have for staff? What are the staff wages? How long have they been there? Um, and, you know, see if you can relate to the previous owner, try to figure out why they're selling. And to be honest with you, after that, you just, you got to put your effort into it. You got to make sure that you spend a lot of your time looking to see what you can do. You know, you should be in there going and and looking in the files. You should be in there looking in drawers. You should be in there when you own it and putting everything you can do. I'm sure that's what Margaret did, even though it was her father's practice. Hey, what's in this cabinet? Why was this here? I start asking questions. Um, you know, once you the the current owner should allow you to have access without the team there. Uh, to keep it quiet, to see if, if you can make it part of something that you want to do. Yeah, I would add, um, you have to have gumption. You <laughs> have to have wherewithal, and you have to have that drive. Um, after you find that practice that feels right to you, I was once checking out a practice, and um, it was a ways out. It was rural. I'm on the east side of Cleveland, and the dentist said to me, they don't want a city girl here. <laughs> it wasn't gonna work, right? So the office has to feel right to you and then you have to have that gumption to get through that major transition, that major transition period. Oh, speaking of city girl, uh, this question is for you, Margaret. Sure. Um, you know, the classes being admitted to dental school now are far more diverse than they were just two generations ago and progress has definitely been made, but at the same time, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to increase diversity in our profession. Um, so as the workforce is becoming more diverse with greater number of women who are dentists, um, how do you think this will impact the profession and what is your advice based on your experience, your challenges and successes to future women entrepreneurs in dentistry? Sure, wow, that's quite a question. <laughs> but. Um, Trying you know, to get in in the next four minutes. Okay, so I think one thing is within medicine and dentistry, um, those that are the providers need to reflect those that are the receiving patients. Um, if we have a diverse nation, which America is, I think providers need to reflect that. That's how you build relationships. You have to be conscientious when it comes to providing for different types of people. So. Um, I am thrilled that there are more women coming into dentistry. Uh, when I came out, my mentors, and they still are today, are 60-year-old men. I have so often sat in a room with the giants in dentistry, the Frank Spears, 
the Greg Kinzers, the people that speak internationally, they're all men. Okay, there's a few women I can count on one hand that speak. So it has been a goal of mine to be courageous, to really work hard on my skills within dentistry so that I can become an expert and present myself to other dentists and present myself as a female entrepreneur within dentistry to be able to have a family um, and to be able to still really be passionate about my career and really have the expertise that um, traditionally the path that has been forged for males that they have shown that this is possible. I want to show that it's possible for women and I hope it continues through school. I want, I want women to be able to see that they can do this. There is a gift within dentistry to be able to work in a setting where you can go home, like Jeff said, and have a weekend. Um, you can focus on family if you want. You can still be super passionate about your career and never want a child um, and be regarded as an amazing dentist. So I feel like it's partly a job of mine to um, lead by example. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's that's how I'm, I'm viewing it, so. All right, thank you so much. So this question, I, you know, we have maybe a couple of minutes left if you could both answer it. Since we have dental students on the line, um, dental education right now is costing about $400,000 for those four years. So what advice would you give? What words of encouragement do you have? Or what would you do differently now that you've been out in practice in terms of overcoming that debt and living comfortably once they're out in practice? Go ahead, Margaret. Oh, sure, sorry. Um, I, I think you, before you make the decision to go to dental school, um, if, if finances aren't secured and you're taking out loans and there will be debt, um, you have to know this is what you want to do. Um, I think you, you have to have a good sense that you're ready to put in four years and then a career where it's expensive to run a practice um, it takes a lot of work and a lot of passion. So I think knowing that this is truly what you want, um, but again, gumption and, and you know, you can be very successful in dentistry. Um, I, I, running a fee-for-service practice is incredibly rewarding. Um, from a financial aspect, yes, too, but um, from a practice standpoint, it's rewarding and um, you, you can, you can be successful, but I think you also have to be well aware that there will be debt and you will have to pay that back. There is a responsibility to, um, to your education. So you will be paying for it for a long time. I don't think people should get out of school and think they're gonna secure a job or buy a practice and be out of debt within five years. It's not a reality. Mm -hmm. It is a long, a long stretch here. And if you love what you do, it becomes part of your life and you pay it back over time and you don't think about it every day. You definitely think about it a lot right after you get out of school. It's on your mind all the time. But as you start to become more comfortable in your practice, you find ways to manage it. And you find that you can still grow even though you owe for your, your, your dental, your dental um, education. Well, thank you so much for both of you for your time. Yeah, I'm a faculty member at the dental school and I'm an employee as a pediatric dentist at Akron Children's Hospital. So I have so much respect uh, for those of you who are wearing the entrepreneurship hat and we appreciate all your feedback and the valuable information you gave us. And we definitely appreciate the audience and the wonderful questions that they shared with all of us. Michael? Thanks, Tanya. Um, well, that was fun. That went fast. Um, great turnout. Um, and Tanya, thank you so much for moderating. You did a wonderful job. And I think mm -hmm. you put both of your case degrees to work here today, both your dental medicine hat and your weatherhead hat. And we're proud thank to have you. you as an alum. And um, to our other alums, Margaret and Jeff, thanks for doing this. It was our first foray in dental entrepreneurship. And actually just seeing the turnout and some of the chat and I know I was, I was messaging with a few folks in the, the School of Dental Medicine. I think that this is, um, there's a lot of opportunity for more dialogue. So um, thank you for doing this today. Sure. Um, I do want to make a couple of announcements. And for those on Zoom, I did post a link to some upcoming events. I mean, I think there are things that we're doing broadly with the Veal Institute around entrepreneurship. I think that could be of interest, including 
I just wanted to highlight next week, we have a couple of things related to our skills lab. Um, we actually have a session on Wednesday. Um, I didn't get to my question for you, Margaret, about social media marketing, because you are the master of, of using social media to share a lot of what you're doing. But we'll be doing something actually next Wednesday at two o'clock as part of our Veal Skills Lab on content marketing. One of our alums, Arnold Huffman, who runs a digital marketing um, agency out of Atlanta and some colleagues are gonna do something next Wednesday at two o'clock. And then next Thursday, at um, also at two o'clock, um, the digital Yalo team is gonna do something on marketing analytics. So I think there are areas of which that, that could be of real interest, I think, to our, to our dental students and entrepreneurs. And um, as we all try to explore um, trends in marketing and what does it mean to put things on Facebook and Instagram and you know Google reviews. So I would encourage this community, hopefully that there's some things that we can do together going forward. Um, and again, thank you so much to the three of you for our first, um, first dental entrepreneurship uh, collaboration and have a wonderful weekend and, and everybody thanks on Zoom and Facebook Live for joining us today.